بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد سيد المرسلين خاتم النبيين وعلى آله وأصحاب أجمعين My dear brother Dr. Abdullah Ghazi My dear sister Dr. Taslim Khan All of my beloved and very many friends whom I see here I greet you with Allah's greeting Assalamu alaikum it is indeed a pleasure for me to be here and to meet uh, dear brothers like Sheikh Mundir, who uh, was so effective the last time that I met him that he uh, induced me to make an investment, as our sister said earlier. Um, I'm tempted to, to start the way our brother Hussein Abiva suggested when he asked me to perhaps ask you if you know what I'm going to talk about tonight. <laughs> I don't seem to see get an answer. Well, I also would like to say that I'm not your keynote speaker, I'm your substitute keynote speaker. Because my wife Daisy, who was supposed to be here this evening, is your keynote speaker, and I was just basically the follow-up. Uh, unfortunately, she gives you all her salams. She went to the airport today. Uh, she was in New York, and uh, her flight got cancelled because of the northeastern storm. I happened to be in Washington. And uh, because I didn't want to return yesterday after giving a speech on Thursday, I decided to stay on in Washington and caught a flight from Washington straight here. And alhamdulillah, I was able to make it in time. But on to why this is very important and why I'm happy to be here and why I believe it's very important for us to support the work of Iqra. Um, Imam Ali who was the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet, said in a, in a very important saying, bring up your children or educate your children for a time different than your own. And this is a saying that the more you think about it, the more you'll repeat it. Many of us have come from different countries and Imam Ali said this at a time and a place and an experience where he pretty much lived in the Hejaz all of his life between Mecca and Medina at a time when change perhaps was not as rapid as we have it today and yet see how marvelous his insight was into sharing with us an insight that is even more relevant today than it was then Teach your children, educate your children for a time different from your own. For many of us, we have to educate our children for a time and a place that is different from our own. And the challenges are enormous. This challenge is not a new one. And the challenge can be described in its eternal construct in the following way. What are the eternal values of our faith? What are my eternal values as an individual? What are our deepest and most cherished values? And how do we restate them in a different context? And to answer this question, we each have to ask ourselves, what is most important for us? And there are many people who don't know the answer to that question. There are many people who live this life without asking them what is their, asking themselves what their most important value is. This is a journey. We are all on a journey. A journey from Allah to Allah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'oon. We exist for the sake of Allah and we certainly are all returning to Allah. What is the point of all of this? What is the point of Allah's creating us, sending us out to return to Him? Allah says in the Quran that if we wanted to entertain ourselves, we would have entertained ourselves on our own. Allah has sent us for a purpose. <coughs> and 
And the purpose, as Allah says, is to worship Him. But I even find the word worship to be insufficient. Because everything worships Allah. What does Allah need? My worship. What is special about your worship? Why does Allah cherish your worship, your differentiated worship, in such a way that it is precious to Him? And this is the question we have to ask ourselves. What is it that God wants from me? And the most wonderful thing of all is that Allah tells us that He created us in His own image. That very language is in the hadith, in the collection of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. But the, the language of the Qur'an is more specific. So Allah created us from a breath of His own spirit. When Allah formed Adam from clay, then He tells the angels, and our brother, I think, our brother Sheikh Mundar mentioned this, that Allah create, announced to the angels that He create a Khalifa on earth. A Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much that the angels themselves were in shock. Because they said, you're going to create a being that is going to create mischief and shed blood on earth. You're going to create Saddam Husseins and Qaddafis and people like that who are creating all kinds of problems and killing people, shedding blood, making a mess of the earth. And all of us, in some way or another, are a little bit like that. But Allah wants something special from us to exhibit His own characteristics. Allah says to the angels, when I have completed the form of Adam, when I shall have breathed into Adam from my own ruh, then fall into prostration to Adam. So what the angels are prostrating to, what the angels are doing sajda to, is not to the body, to the physiology of Adam, but to the ruh of Ar-Rahman in Adam. And each of us, brother and sisters, each of us has a piece of this ruh in ourselves. And the mandate that Allah has given every human being is to protect, to grow, to amplify the presence of this breath of the divine in us. And that is the primary and ultimate objective of anything that can be called an Islamic education. It is an unending journey. It is a journey that has a beginning but has no end. The journey continues. And I'm always learning. And today I was even happy and humbled to learn from you. To learn from the examples of what I've seen today. Not only what I know of Dr. Ghazi and his beloved wife, but what I've also learned of Sister Maryam, Sister Mary Ali, and her devotion, and her sincerity, and her commitment, and her devotion to the community through at least two generations. And many of you here, I met also Brother Warithuddin, the son of the famous Warithuddin Muhammad whom I had the opportunity to meet his father and grandfather with my late father here in this city of Chicago. And I could not help but trace as I was watching, this is my third time this year and the first time I think that I came to Chicago three times in one year, in less than a year, Dr. Yudsever was one of my hosts just basically not even two months ago uh, and at the Istna conference as well. A great city, Chicago although I'm not sure so how well the Chicago Bears have been doing lately. Um, <laughs> some good fans here. 
That's the one game I like to watch, actually. I do love football. American football is something. It took me a few years to got to like it, but I really, it got under my skin after a while. Um, but coming back to the issue of education, this is the education which Dr. Razi is doing, Dr. Yudsef is doing at the Islamic College, that Sister Mary has been doing, that Brother Warithuddin Muhammad has been doing, an education of the soul, an education which begins with the soul, an education which continues with the mind, an education of the heart, an education of the body. Because our spiritual masses have taught us that the human being is, a, is an emulsion, if you will, to use a language from physics, or a mixture of four different dimensions of being. Our physical being, our emotional being, the part that loves and hates and, 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 and is, is subject to all the emotions, what our, our Christian brothers and sisters calls the seven deadly sins, of which the greatest is pride or arrogance, greed, sloth, We have a mind, aql, and which Allah always is asking us to develop. Afala yaqilun, afala taqilun. Allah is always saying, you know, don't you use your aql? I don't speak Urdu, but my wife taught me aql is temal karo. You know. So this is a very Islamic question, a very Islamic commandment. Use the aql, use your mind. It is a it is a rational faith. Our faith is one which demands rationality. And as our brother Sheikh Mundar also said, that the ones who know Allah the most are the ulama, the people who have ilm, have true knowledge. Part of the ability to understand God requires ilm, but ilm of all of its, all of its categories. And then the dimension of the soul. Because the knowledge which comes, soul knowledge, becomes hikmah, wisdom. Allah says in the Quran, whoever has been given hikmah has been given the really great khair. The greatest good is wisdom. And all this requires people who are our exemplars, who teach us, who show us the way. I am the beneficiary of many people, not only my late father, but the opportunity to see many people whom I said, well, you know what, I like my father in this way, but my father is, was not a very good dresser, and I would love so-and-so in the way he dressed, or so-and-so in the way he spoke, or as an orator, or as a speaker. So I had many, many models, many people, many men, whom I looked up as exemplars. And lately, with my wife's help, we've had a women's uh, initiative. And just last week, we came from Turkey, where we had our third uh, women's such conference. Women with 175 women from 45 countries, women of enormous capacity. And every time I see these women and hear them speak, I say to myself, if I was a young boy, I would be proud to take any one of these women as my examples. So we have within our community great capabilities, great intelligence, great wisdom. And the time has come for us, brothers and sisters, because at this moment I believe the Muslim community is going through a major turning point. And I'm talking about the Ummah as a whole. I just celebrated my 63rd birthday last week. And I've been a, an observer of Islam for the last 60 years of my life. And I've noticed that in my own life, the path of Islam and Muslims globally has taken certain shifts and turns. I would say in the last 30, 35 years, we have seen the dominance of a triumphalist, inquisition-style Islam, a terrorist style understanding and interpretation of Islam, an Islam that, is, that does not think in terms of multiplicity of the truth, that although it knows there are four madhabs, they act like there's only one true madhab and anything else is un-Islamic. 
if you don't agree with them that you are haram and it's Muslims that, that are, find it very easy to call somebody else a kafir and I believe we're now going through a turning point a major turning point where the Muslim community is tired of this, inter of this narrow interpretation of Islam that rejects it and the time has come for us to make a very clear statement that that is not the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The time has come for us brothers and sisters to chart the journey forward for an understanding of Islam which is true to our real tradition. And, un and, and that is, has to be based upon understanding and wisdom and knowledge. I have been surprised by how little we know of our own faith and of our own history. And the more we learn of it, the more our minds expand. Many people are unaware and they think that everything that is other than the Quran or the Hadith is un-Islamic. Well, that is not the teachings of the Prophet. The Prophet said that knowledge is the lost inheritance of any Muslim. It belongs to him wherever he or she finds it. The Prophet said, seek knowledge as far as China. The Muslim scholars said, you don't go to China to learn tafsir of the Quran. So all that knowledge is the obligation of the Muslim. Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave, the Prophet taught us. So every kind of knowledge should be our knowledge. Not the attitude that, the, oh, this is un-Islamic. And therefore we have to Islamize it. Well, I don't know which, what it means. Much of the heritage that people call Islamic civilization is Muslims adapting and adopting the pre-Islamic civilization, making it theirs and adding to it in the field of philosophy, in the field of law, in the field of mathematics, in the field of construction. The dome which people think is unique feature of the mosque was actually borrowed from the church. The famous church Hagia Sophia in Istanbul was a cathedral it was completed in 537, more than 30 years, 35 years before the Prophet was born. It was adopted by Muslims. Now people think the dome is an Islamic feature. The word mufti and fatwa came from Roman law. The Romans had a prudent, what they call a prudent, in every town. People would go and ask him a question of law. What is the right decision on something? We, this is an Arabic word, but was based upon pre-Islamic law and jurisprudence. Many aspects of our heritage, um, as a great friend of mine on a project that I'm doing, the late Professor Mahmoud Ghazi, who was a professor of law and was minister of Awqaf in Pakistan, is that if you read the Mustasfa of Imam al-Ghazali, a book on Islamic law, you cannot understand it if you don't understand Greek philosophy. So this shows the attitude of the people whom we call Hujjat al-Islam, which Imam al-Ghazali was called, was based upon an attitude that adopted all knowledge and gathered it all in. And this is the kind of understanding of our tradition, of our history, and this is the imperative of our faith that we have to commit to moving forward. And wherever I have gone in the Muslim world, I've seen that the majority of Muslims genuinely believe in these principles, but may not have heard it explained to them in a way that enables them to say, I've always felt this was my religion, but nobody expressed it to me in this manner. The time has come, brothers and sisters, for us to amplify that message of Islam. And amongst many of you here, all of you here in various degrees, 
are ambassadors of this message and believers in this message. And therefore it is your duty and our collective duty to preach these ideas and these ideals. Because that is the Islam which non-Muslims want to see and long to see, but don't. It is false from my experience that Americans want to hate Islam and Muslims. It is wrong for Muslims to believe that America wants to be at war with Islam and Muslims. No religious war in history has resulted in the victory of one religion over another. The Crusades did not result in the end of Christianity or Islam. The split of India and the conflict between Hindus and Muslims has not resulted in the elimination of either Hinduism or Islam. But no political regime has ever taken on religion and won. None. The mighty Roman Empire tried for three centuries to destroy Christianity. Eventually, Rome became the capital of the Roman Catholic Church, which thrived for another 17 centuries. The Nazis tried to destroy Judaism and Jews by committing genocide. The Jewish state of Israel was born on the still warm ashes of the Third Reich of the Nazi rule. The Soviets tried to eliminate all of religion in the ex-Soviet republics. Within a little over half a century, communism died. And now nobody cares about communism anymore. And religion is coming back into all the ex-Soviet republics in a very powerful way. Therefore, anyone or any political regime or any, and even you might say, in our p many parts of the Muslim world, whether it's in Turkey or Iran or Egypt under Ataturk, Abdul Nasser, or there were attempts to suppress religion, and what has happened? In all of these countries, Islam has come back much, much more strongly. And the idea of a militant anti-religious secularism is no longer in vogue. And therefore the suggestion that America is at war with Islam and Muslims is incoherent, it is silly, it is stupid, it is dangerous, and is false. And if it were the case, there is no way that America could win this war, based upon history. But we have an important role and responsibility, my dear brothers and sisters. Because we are, as American Muslims, as Western Muslims, we are at the intersection of the West and Islam. So if there is a war between the Islamic civilization and the Western civilization, we are the contact point. And because America is the remaining superpower, we as American Muslims have a particular role and a particular responsibility to play. And this is something which is natural, because any country which is a superpower, the community in that country which represents that particular faith will have a larger than life role to play in the global picture of that faith. Therefore, in the last century, for example, the role of American Catholics in reshaping the direction of Catholicism was larger than life was the American Catholic bishops that played a very important role in, in bringing about Vatican II in 1965 and in changing the Vatican's attitude upon the relationship of church and state. It was the American Jewish community that were responsible more than any other community in helping bring about the birth of Israel and the support for Israel that we see today in the world. And therefore, the American Muslim community has a role to play in being the mediators or interlocutors between this superpower 
and the Muslim Ummah. In order for us to implement and carry and execute this role requires not only individuals, it requires individuals, it requires institutions, and it requires a sense of who we are as American Muslims. But as American Muslims, we are still a work in progress. And I've always been talking and thinking, ever since I arrived in this country, about the need for us to evolve out of the multicultural and multinational cross-section that we are as Muslims today. Because the American Muslim community is a cross-section of the whole global Muslim Ummah. It is like Hajj, where you have Muslims from all over the world, except we are permanently here. In Hajj, we're there for maybe, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, you perform the Hajj and we go back home. But here we are here permanently. And out of this international, multinational cross-section of the whole global Ummah, we have to integrate ourselves some way or evolve ourselves some way into being American Muslims or Muslim Americans, however you want to say it. Now, people ask me, what do you mean by that? And I say, rewind the tape of our history and think of when Islam began in the Hejaz and how it spread to Egypt, to Byzantium, to Persia. These were not Muslim nations. When did they become Muslims? Now, I grew up in Egypt. We, did, we didn't think of Islam as an Arab religion, Hejaz, we thought of it as an Egyptian religion. I see my brothers from Turkey, they don't think of Islam as a Hejazi Arab religion, they think of it as a Turkish religion. My friends from Pakistan know that 70 years ago, there's, ago, there's no Pakistan. But they think of Islam as a Pakistani religion. I grew up 10 years in Malaysia, the only country I know where the Malaysian constitution says a Malay is constitutionally a Muslim. In fact, when I was growing up, when a Chinese person converted to be a Muslim, they wouldn't say he became Muslim, he says he became Malay. He said, Masuk Malayu, he entered Malayness. Now, what happened? in the history of those societies which made them think of the Islam as Egyptian, as Malay, as Turkish, as Iranian, as Pakistani. How did that happen? It happens when the creed and faith of Islam becomes restated in the cultural and institutional and legal aspects of that society. So, m Muslims in Malaysia, they wear a sarong, they wear the baju malayus. Muslims in Pakistan or India wear sharwal kameezes. They have a different tradition. And this happened even in our jurisprudence. When Muslims first began to go and you had the people of Mecca were called Ahl al-Hadith and the people in, in Kufa and Baghdad and Basra and Iraq were called Ahl al-Ra'd, the people of opinion, because it was more multicultural, so the jurisprudence had to, to be different. The core is the same, but this is where the madhahibs of fiqh began. Even Imam al-Shafi'i, anybody who studies Islamic law 101, knows that Imam al-Shafi'i changed his fatawa from when he was in, in Iraq to his fatawa in, in when he was in Egypt. They call it his fatawa al-Araqiyya, his fatawa al-Masriyya. The same madhab, the same mujtahid, the same founder of the school of jurisprudence, and yet in a different context, his fatawa would shift. So what we need in America today is to evolve ourselves from being what I call Muslims in America, Many of us imported, with an imported attitude attached to back home, 
to developing ourselves as American Muslims. It'll take a while till this happens. It typically takes two or three generations for it to happen. And for our African American Muslims who are Americans, have always been Americans for several centuries now, the question for us is how do we integrate ourselves into a sense of who we are as American Muslims? When that happens in an American religion, in the same way that you think of Pakistanis think of Islam as a Pakistani religion, or Turks as a, is, Islam as a Turkish religion, or Iranians think of Islam as an Iranian religion. When that happens, then we will know that we are American Muslims. But there's the task that lies ahead of us. And the task requires work on a legal level, institutional level, theological level, cultural level, societal and social level. And this requires the work of people who have ilm who have knowledge, who have wisdom, who have an understanding both of the society in which they are and the understanding of their faith and the eternal principles of their faith. So they can actually be the ones who do what Imam Ali said, educate your children for a time different than your own, for a time and a place different than your own for a context that is different than your own. And that is why we have to support our institutions that are on the forefront of this type of activity. And I'm proud to consider myself a friend and a brother and an admirer of Dr. Ghazi and Mrs. Ghazi for what they have done to, to attempt in their devotion and to institutionalize a methodology of instruction, of pedagogy, of education that tries to encapsulate and, and make this wisdom and knowledge available not only to us as American Muslims but also to Muslims around the world. If Allah were to reveal the Quran today, I was wondering whether he would say Iqra and, and whether he would say Alam bil Qalam or Alam bil iPad. You know, they would say, who taught by the pen or taught by an iPad. And I was thinking, you know, when, my, when, when I was a young boy and I would go to our village and see the way my father was studying the Quran, they used to have this little chalkboard, which is exactly the size of an iPad, with a chalk and board they would rub on it. And I wonder if, you know, today it looks, it reminds me of that chalkboard that, you know, in our kutab, people used to study the Quran with. And I'm told by my many people and friends of mine who have two-year-old children that their two-year-old children are now, you know, learning with the iPad. So it wouldn't be surprising now if we have even, um, you know, Iqra apps for, for, the, for the iPad so that two-year-olds can start, you know, learning and, and drawing and writing things. But such is the, the, the notion of the context of tomorrow differing from the context of yesterday and how we have to prepare and educate the next generation, our children and your 11 grandchildren, Sister Mary, for a time very different than your own. But it's indeed a source of pride for me to be here and a source of pride to be, to be with you all, uh, great Muslims, sincere, committed, men and women of conviction, of deep conviction, who are all looking to establish the word of Allah on earth. Because at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, nothing is more important than being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is more important than the ability to, to stand up on the day of judgment and to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we, to forgive us for our sins, but to be grateful for the opportunity that he gave us to reflect his attributes. In fact, the Prophet is said to have taught us in the hadith, adorn yourselves with the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the most important aspect of Allah are his being, because Allah's primary attributes 
our absolute being, the reality, the haqiqah, his al-haq, his absolute mercy and compassion, his rahmah, which includes his love, and his absolute consciousness, which means his ilm and his hikmah. He said that all the others are secondary after that. Absolutely real, absolutely compassionate, and absolutely knowing and conscious and aware. And of all the attributes that we should gain ourselves are these three. To be real, to be authentic, to be true. To be compassionate, to be forgiving, to be loving, and to be ultimately knowing and wise. I therefore urge you again to do all you can to support our brother Dr. Abdullah Ghazi and his beloved wife, whom I really admire and love deeply, for they have expressed their love not only to their family, but they have expanded the, the boundaries of their love to teach and educate not all as many people as they can possibly do. And for this they deserve our support, our respect, and our great gratitude to them all. Finally, my dear brothers and sisters, all of you, as our brother said, is a ra'in. All of you are a shepherd. You are responsible for your, for your flock, whether it's your children, your family, your students, your employees, whomever they might be. But in each case, the responsibility is, involves also one of a transfer because a civilization is not just a concept, it is people. And it is one generation that passes its experience to another. And therefore the, the most precious thing that we can do is to transfer our, the best of what we have learned to our students and our children. Whether it is knowledge of prayer, whether it is how to cook the best possible biryani, or a best possible um, kebabs or whatever it might be I mean but but as Allah says as the Prophet says rather that Allah loves that whoever of you does something that you itqina, that you do it with itqan that you do it with 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 perfection with the highest possible quality if you're a doctor be the best possible doctor if you are a, a, a cook be the best possible chef be the best in what you do. And as long as you're the best in what you do, that you will feel that you are at that moment an instrument of the divine will. My dear brothers and sisters, I thank you very much again for having invited me, uh, for being patient with me, and to forgive me if I've said anything that may have offended any of you. And I want also like to express my gratitude to all of those who have taught me today how wonderful a community we are that in spite of all of our weaknesses, we have something very precious. We are the inheritors of Rasulullah Wasallam, And that the scholars, as the Prophet said, are the heirs of the Prophet. And therefore we should be among those who seek to make sure that our heirs, not just our heirs, but also our heirs of Rasulullah, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. May Allah shower his blessings. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. May Allah shower his special salams and blessings and barakah upon the soul of our beloved Prophet Muhammad and upon all of those scholars and the generation of scholars who have preceded us, who live with us, and whom we have the responsibility and obligation of bequeathing what we have learned from the past to that generation and create a new flowering, a new renaissance of Islam in the world and may we be among those who are the spearhead of such a renaissance of the true Islam, a religion of peace, a religion of compassion, a religion of haq, as Allah says, a deen, a deen al-haq, and a deen of rahmah, and the deen of ilm. Brothers and sisters, I thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته